today is November the 13th and this is the week of the virtual guild fair so I wanted to post a few photos of what goes on out here in the pasture because this is my raw material producers here these are the lambs from last year that are half blue faced Lester, but right here, this funny looking one is a Shetland. So I have a smorgasbord flock with all different kinds of wool. This is Martha Owen, and I'm bringing you greetings from the area called Martins Creek, which is outside of Murphy, North Carolina. And I'm coming today to talk to you about what I do all the time, which is follow sheep, play with border collies, and make yarn. So first, I need to introduce this little old gal right here. This is the, the wheel that started the whole thing. My mother went down to Gainesville, Georgia, and visited her aunt, my great aunt, Sally. And she came home with this spinning wheel and she put it in front of me and said, there, you always did like weird stuff and walked off. At that point, I had never met a spinning wheel. I was knitting already, but I didn't know how to make yarn. I didn't know how to do anything and my, of that style. My grandmother was reading the Cherokee Scout, which is a, it's a local newspaper. And she said, look here, they're having a class in spinning and dyeing at the John C. Campbell Folk School. Why don't you go down and learn? So I thought, okay. So I went down to learn. It was a two-week class. We learned how to wash wool, to pick wool, to card wool, to spin wool. And our first tool was a potato with a pencil stuck through it. And then we learned how to run dye pots. And my head was turned. It was what I wanted to do forever after. And so that was like in 1978. And now... <laughs> We are 42 years later, and I'm still way into what I do. I can't live without wool. Today is getting a little bit cold, so I've got my sweater and my scarf on because we're outside. And these are my border collies, Leaf and Bella, and they seem to know when I'm trying to do something like this, and they just turn up, and so does the C-A-T. So anyway, here's the old gal that my little mama gave me. The thing about my mama was she was not interested in working with her hands, but she was an engineer. This old wheel had a, a, a shimmy does it shook. So we spent a week trying to get it to not throw its drive band. So you're going to learn all this vocabulary in just a moment. Let me turn here and show you what's behind me. Down in the pasture, which is kind of a long ways from here, I have 40 sheep. We sheared them in May. When you shear a sheep, you cut the wool off its head, down its belly, down its legs, and you put it on its side, and you shear, 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 till you get the other side of its backbone. Then you start lifting it up, and you go around the shoulders, around the middle, around the tail, and the sheep wanders off, and what I have, well, actually, it looks like a goat, but what I have left is a big pile of wool, and it's at the shearer's feet. I'm not usually doing the shearing myself. So I pick up the big bundle of wool and I fling it onto the skirting table. This is the skirting table. I walk around the outside edges and I look for things that I don't want to spin, things that are matted or extremely dirty or, yeah, that'll do, matted or extremely dirty. I'm trying to grow clean wool so my sheep actually have worn coats from about now. This is November till because I start feeding them hay until the time we shear them which is usually the first weekend in May and what I'm trying to do is keep the wool clean and a sheep doesn't understand that it's wearing a great sweater on its back what it understands is that it's hungry so I want to keep all the wool as clean as possible and we're going to show you how I work with the wool here in just a little minute this card here is of all, it's a little piece from all of the fleeces that came off of our sheep. So people will call me up and say, Martha, I want to make a black sweater. And I go find a black fleece for them. Or I say, oh, I want to do some dyeing. So I will take and wash the white ones. 
and each wool is better for a particular product than another. Some are softer, so you make a shawl out of them. Some are stronger, so you make a rug out of them. Okay? So we're going to talk about various parts of this whole business. But first, let me show you this basket. This is a basket of dyed colors. So these washed fleeces started off kind of creamy colored and by the time I got done with them they still have a certain creamy yellowness to them but they've lost the mud that they were carrying here's this one which was kind of up here with these colors and now it's a more brown so when I look at life and I look at color and I think about how I want to blend things I then go and get my fleeces I wash them and then I decide how to dye them. So for example, we have here marigolds that dyed this yellow. Then I put it in a, a pot with iron, and the iron could be rusty nails or something I use called ferrous sulfate. This came from madder. This is a very old time dye of the mountains was madder. And this came from cochineal, which a lot of people don't know, but they probably put it on their lips in lipstick or for hair color, for cosmetics, um, and it's a beetle that grows on prickly pear cactus. So it's from uh, Florida, New Mexico, or South America mostly. They have to have that prickly pear cactus, and it makes this little beetle, it grow, <laughs> these little beetles will grow on there, and when you cook the poor little things, they make this beautiful magenta color. Lovely. So I take all these colors and I decide what I want to make, okay? And, and I might be looking at grass or stained glass windows or painting. Oh, here's one other color that everybody likes a lot. Indigo, blue, oh, 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 oh right? All right, so we're going to take this basket inside and I'm going to show you how I would use it. All right, here we go. We're going to just step inside. We're going to hope that these dogs don't come in with us, but they might. Who can say we have a cat? So this is going to go way over here. But what I'm going to show you first is way over here. These are some little bits of dyed color. Some is natural sheep colors. There's some um, white and some dark brown. And I have pick them open with my fingers, like so. I've put a drop of oil on them so that the fibers move apart easily. And then I have these, which are called hand cards. So years ago, I helped to set up the, I was a volunteer for the summer at the Murphy Historical Museum. And there was a man whose name is escaping me right now. Oh, oh like Herman West. I'm asking my husband. <laughs> I can't remember his name. Anyway, he started collecting things. He saw that the old ways were passing by, and he started collecting tools. And a lot of folk museums have started this very way. And he had in his collection, before it was set up in Murphy, 100 pairs of hand cards. So I, of course, begged for a pair for me, because I already knew how to spin by then and I begged for a pair for the John C. Campbell Folk School so people can see what the old cards look like. But this is an active craft that's still continuing to this day, and it gives us a lot of creative freedom when it comes to our own clothing, which I think is very important. So the carters are paddles. And I don't really, uh, I'm not a historian. I just know that these go way, way back. They're, they're not, they're after the Iron Age, but I don't know when exactly. You would have had to have the technology to push these teeth through a leather backing. So I think working with wood is much older, but how to get these teeth bent and how to get them through leather backing, that's the big question. So we're gonna have to go look that one up. So they're like staples, but they're all pointed towards the handle. And what I do is I take both my cards, let's see if I can balance one here, and I take that wool that I have pulled apart and I put it on one of the carters. Then I take the other one and I start brushing. And what this does is it opens the fibers so that they're like a big fuzzy thing. 
and it also blends the colors. It takes a little stamina, but a lot of people have done this for many, many years. At the time when I volunteered at that museum, I kept bumping into people that were in their 80s and 90s. I'd be doing a demonstration someplace and they'd say, oh, I used to do that for my grandmother. And a lot of times in this area, they were doing it for a quilt bat, for a quilt bat. And this is exactly what you do with cotton as well. So does this look any different? Oh, I think so. Instead of doing another one, which I really want to do, we're going to go to this style of spinning wheel because we have many things to show you this afternoon. So this wheel is called a walking wheel or a great wheel or a wool wheel. It's also in Scotland called a muckle wheel. And you see, it's just a simple pulley system. Now I've just put a new drive band on, so we're gonna hope that she is cooperative. All spinning wheels are female, okay? So I just hope she wants to play with me. And I'm gonna turn this big wheel and the drive band turns this point. So it's not making thread yet. There's the step that has to happen, we're gonna try this bumpy one first, is that I have to pop the stretched out fiber off the point at a 45 degree angle. If I go straight, it just comes off. If I go at a 90 degree angle, it winds on. So I'm just trying to do this at a 45 degree angle. There is called a walking wheel or a wool wheel or a great wheel. And that's what I think of personally as the wheel of the mountain south. When I was a kid, I remember seeing spinning wheels like this still standing on people's porches. Not that anybody spun on them, but they were around, they were everywhere. Um, a high wheel like this, or actually did I say high wheel? High wheel, great wheel, wool wheel, and in Scotland, muckle wheel, is a simple pulley system. So we have a big drive wheel, turning a very small wheel here with a string. And every time the string pulls, it turns this disc, which is attached to this spike. What puts the twist in is every time it pops off the end of the spike, it puts in a twist. So that wasn't a great example. We'll try again. So I come out here where it's already spun. I draw it off at a 45 degree angle. Oh, I remember this carded roll of wool. It wasn't very well carded. So we have a textured yarn. Once I have it drawn out to my satisfaction, then I'm pinching off here and I'm letting the twist accumulate in between these two places, between the point and my pinched fingers. Then I back it up and wind it on. Jump back out and I'm stretching out the loose wool. So this style of wheel came after the hand spindle in development. And after that came what's called a flyer wheel. And we're gonna see one of those here just in a second. As people started leaving the land and moving to the factories, they used a tool very much like this, although it would have had many spindle points going back and forth and the fiber would have been prepared differently. So I'm gonna show you a step up advancement wise and speed wise from hand carts. All right, so I'm gonna walk over here to this. So for a hand worker like myself, this was a big uh, development. This is one of the places that I did borrow money for my business. Otherwise, as I was going along, I would get a little more money and I would buy another tool. But this costs a significant amount and you'll see it is like a cradle and a boat shape, and it has these great big teeth, which are quite sharp. There's lots of them. And when I was first learning to use this, this is called a picker. I 
ripped the pocket right off of my shirt. Now I can read a book at the same time because I have figured out where to stand when I'm using this thing. Uh, some people will put a leather apron on, but I've sort of worked it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take wool out of my basket here and I'm going to pick it open. Instead of using my fingers, now I'm going to use this device, which is called a picker. Uh, it does, in fact, look like a medieval instrument of torture, and I've only had to threaten a couple children to make them be good. Um, I do have safety um, bars so that I can stop the picker from swinging back and forth. But really, we've, we've hardly gotten hurt with it. But we could if we wanted to. I guess we could. So as I go back and forth, those many teeth are passing the wool back and forth. And I'll have a big plan. I have a lot of postcards I'm looking at, or paintings, or the, the landscape, and I'll say, oh, well, there's this beautiful cloud. I think I need to have some white in there. However you get your ideas. That's what I do. But I want it in yarn. I love beautiful things, but I love practical things, too. So I love to wear all the colors that I put together. So that was white. And generally what I do is I pick all my colors separately and they all fall down into that box and then I'm going to show you how I card them. So for fun, let's think about, you know, candy canes. Why not? So this is the wool I was telling you was dyed with cochineal. And I'm going to go back and forth on it. I'm just going to drop into my box. all puffed up. Now I have a, a, a choice at this point. I could spin the wool right out of my basket or I could spin it after it's been picked or I can card it first and I'll get different kinds of yarn each time. So that's the fun that can be had, all the design possibilities. So I'm going to take the, the, little, the wool out of here and throw it in my box. Now one thing that has to happen is I need to lubricate my fibers. So we had a mill in Andrews, North Carolina that was owned by J.C. Christians and, and he shut about two years ago and I was able to buy the lubricant that he liked for his small mill. And of course the bottle is about empty. So I'm not getting it super wet. I can use baby oil or uh, some people use olive oil, believe it or not. And here's some old that I was doing before. So now I've got white and pink. And I'm going to just blend it with my hands first. Why not? I'm going to have a multicolored yarn. Let's get some of this too. Then I come over to my drum carter. So when we look at the structure of the teeth, they're very much like what were on those hand cards. But this time, this is a step up production-wise because I'm going to get a bat instead of one little carded roll. And this was the first thing that was industrialized uh, in the yarn making business where you have big carters with lots of drums. So what I have is just this one which makes a bat and it has two drums. The wool gets pushed into the front and will come up between the two drums. And I try not to struggle with it. I'm trying not to put too much in at a time. I just had to push on it there for a second, so I'm going to try not to do that. Let's try some of our blue and white. Whoop. I have very chapped hands, and so the wool is sticking to my fingers. So you keep on going until nothing transfers. It all just rides around on this drum. So it'll be three or four ounces. And if I then can spin it all into yarn, I would have enough to make a hat. So I can do all my designing for my garment right here on this drum carter. It comes with a gap in the teeth. So I have this tool, which is called a doffer. To doff means to take off. And I come right down this gap and I break the fibers apart. And then I turn it backwards. 
So I have not put very much in, so we're just going to pretend like this is a big full bat. It would come off more cleanly if I had more wool on it, but this is what we've got today. Then I can look through my bat and see if I have big clumps of stuff that didn't get carded very well, like right there. And I could send it through again, blend it, make more blended colors. Um, and then from there, I can decide to twist it together with something of the same color or a different color. Right here, we see a pile of yarn that I did just on this drum carter. And different parts were combined in different ways, so I have bright combinations and dark combinations. So a big reason why I make yarn is to make the yarn I want to make. So I'm hoping that'll be a sweater for a grandson. Then we come over to this style of spinning wheel. So I showed you the high wheel or the walking wheel. Uh, there was this guy named Leonardo da Vinci. Did you ever hear of him? In his lifetime, there were all these inventions that were created to make textiles faster. And one of the things they wanted to invent was a wheel that you could sit down to use. Instead of having a hand spindle which you spun and stopped and wound on, or that wheel that you spin off the point and stop and wind on, this one is an automatic wind on wheel. So this bat that I took off of the drum carter, I can make it be like the hand carded roll by just breaking it across, which is kind of how it would come off of the hand card. And I can just pretend I did it on the hand card. On this style of wheel, I'm sitting down to use it. And when my hands are out here hanging on, Everything travels the same speed, but as soon as my, my hand that's controlling the yarn heads towards the wheel, one part goes faster than the other and it winds on. So what we have here, this is called the flyer, this is the bobbin, it stores the wool, and then we have grooves that this string is going into, and one groove affects the flyer and one groove affects how fast it winds on on the bobbin. So if we look sideways or we look that way, I don't know where the camera person is, you'll see one turns more often because one is smaller than the other. It is a pulley system. This is called the double drive system because I've got a big string that goes around the whole business, then it goes around again and around the groove in the end of the bobbin. And if it won't pull, then I tighten this handle up front and this whole part gets more distance which puts more pressure which makes it pull again. All right, I'm not a physics major but something like that. The parts of the wheel have some romantic names. I'll tell you one or two of them. I told you the bobbin and the flyer goes very very fast. Maybe that's why it's a flyer. These are called the maidens. And all of this, the maidens, the bob and the flyer, all of that's called the mother of all. Or I have a friend, Pam Howard, who calls it the mother of it all. And I think that's about right. So I can spin and get one kind of yarn by making a piece that goes straight across. But I can get a different kind of yarn, meaning color, by pulling a lengthwise strip. And I can also change my spinning style to do a forward pushing towards the wheel. This is more what you call worsted draw. The other was woolen draw. And if everything goes right and it's a good day and you've had enough to eat and enough sleep, it's quite a peaceful experience. I've had an okay day, so I'm very happy to be sitting here spinning now. I would love to teach you how to spin. You can most often find me at the John C. Campbell Folk School. You can go to the website, folkschool.org. My personal email is MarthaOwenWoolens at gmail.com.
I'm also on Facebook and Instagram because I'm such a colorful character, but you will only ever see pictures of sheep and wool and yarn and color. Thanks.